And we would sort these things out if the right people had all the right motivations. What's the best way to solve the climate crisis? You may think that modern technologies are the answer. Wind turbines and solar panels generate clean energy from our weather, and carbon capture and storage can suck up those remaining pesky emissions from the air, storing them underground or in a useful product like cement or carbonated drinks. These technologies have been around for a while and are finally starting to become economically viable, yet we're still not seeing anywhere near as rapid a decarbonisation transformation as we need. To understand why we are collectively so hesitant, there may be something more fundamental that we need to think about first – our mindset. Professor Mike Berners-Lee has been a researcher of sustainability, carbon footprinting and solutions to climate change for over 20 years and has written three, soon to be four books on the subject. So, uh, so I'm Mike Berners-Lee, I'm um, a professor at Lancaster University. Uh, I run a sustainability consultancy that advises organizations of every type you can think of on how to respond to the climate and ecological emergency that we're in. Uh, and I've written some books, including most recently, There Is No Planet B. In chapter eight of his book, There Is No Planet B, Mike discusses values, truth and trust. He points out that we largely have the technological solutions required to tackle the climate crisis. Yet, to effectively implement those solutions, we need to question our own personal values and how we select our leaders in society. We were lucky enough to spend some time with Professor Berners-Lee to ask him some insightful questions. So, what is Mike's outlook on the climate crisis? Even since I wrote There's No Planet B, uh... I think I'm coming more and more to the position that, you know, it maybe it's the, it is the critical thing. You know, if humans are going to thrive over the coming decades and centuries, you know, maybe the critical thing is that we, uh, is that we sort out this culture of truth and kindness. And what takes me to that position more and more is that, you know, when you look at what's going on in the world, we've got, you know, we've got an environment, uh, a climate crisis, a, a biodiversity crisis, we've got a feed the world crisis, we've got all these kind of, you know, physical challenges that we need to deal with. And they're all complex and difficult, but it turns out that we, we can deal with them. We've got the science and the technology. All we need is the kind of the cooperation and the, and, and the detailed planning and so on to sort it out. And, you know, that's not the bottleneck. What goes wrong is that the wrong people are making the wrong decisions from the wrong motivations. So that becomes the critical thing. More and more, I'm thinking, you know, we would sort these things out if the right people, if the, if the decision makers had all the right motivations. So that's why it boils down to honesty and kindness. And so, you know, honesty is getting corrupted by, um, you know, vested interests and lobbying and people having agendas that they're not transparent about. Kindness and honesty are kind of two, two must-have ingredients for humanity going forward, and that you know you know we've been able to get away um, with a lower standard on those two things than we're going to be able to get away with in the future. Why is a lack of truth and kindness so common at the top level of politics and media when we should elect competent, selfless, and benevolent leaders? Well, I think it's. Uh... It's a mixture of things. I think it's partly a, a cultural thing. I think we just don't insist on it enough in every walk of life. And so it finds its way into our politics, our media and our, um, and our businesses as well. It's partly that we're not good enough at telling the difference between when someone's being truthful and when they're not. Um, and it's partly, I think, that we set up a political system which in some ways it's pretty brutal to be a politician in it. <laughs> Probably a mixture of all those three things. But you know, some of them are things we absolutely should be doing something about. We, you know, and some of them are things that we can actually, all of us can do something to try and to try and change. Why do selfish motivations, such as financial incentives, win over motivations that benefit the many? Well, I think we I think we allow a situation in which 
people who aren't truthful enough and are motivated in the wrong way can get to the top. If we had a, uh, a more ubiquitous standard of, you know, asking really carefully, does this person have a track record of really respecting the truth and insisting on the truth, then there are a lot of people in politics in the UK today, but not just in the UK, I mean, all over the world, who just simply wouldn't be there in any even vaguely democratic um, society. Uh, but we allow them there because elections come around and we don't talk anything like enough about truthfulness. And actually, you know, there are a lot of people badly tarred with that brush. And in the kind of culture that I'd like to see, all those people would now be begging for their political careers, eating a lot of humble pie, you know, and asking with their, themselves very hard if there's anything they could do to win back the trust of an electorate who just won't ever vote for anybody who is prepared to put up with people being careless with the truth. And just to be really clear, I'm not just talking about lying. I'm talking about any kind of narrative that encourages people to have a, um, an inaccurate view of the world. So, you know, the 350 million pounds a week for the NHS on the side of a bus wasn't necessarily specifically a lie as such, but it was definitely deliberately misleading. Well, anyone who's trying to do that with you right, is trying to manipulate you into doing something against your interests. They're trying to get you to have an incomplete understanding or a or a misguided understanding of reality in order to, for you to vote in a particular way or behave in a particular way. Well, there isn't any place for that uh, in, our, in our politics. If we had only selected for kind com and compassionate MPs, for example, uh, they would be honest because what they would want would be what would be in the sort of collective best interests of everybody. And why would they ever want to give us a false impression of what's going on? They wouldn't, they wouldn't need to. And it goes back to our media as well. So we've allowed a situation where the media is uh, often owned by very rich individuals who have you know, a particular political um, inclination that suits their own financial vested interests. And we have political, we have politicians who are kowtowing to them. And what we, the public, can do is be much more discerning about whether or not we are confident that the media we're absorbing will always give us the best possible, the most accurate possible representation of reality, or will it sometimes be warped by their own personal vested interests? And if we think that that's the case, if we think they've got a track record for dishonesty, or if we're, we're, we think that they are owned and therefore influenced by somebody or some group that doesn't share the best interests of people and planet um, with us, then you know, that's all we need to know to say we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be absorbing that media and we should be switching. We have less say over the business practices of large companies than we do politicians. What needs to be changed to make it possible for company executives to make more environmentally friendly decisions? It's harder to get transparency very often in businesses. For, you know, for us as the public, when we, when, you know, we go and buy something or we, you know, in some way engage with some business, it's very hard for us to get to the bottom of the ethics of that business. Um, but part of it is uh, the onus is on us to try harder. So we've got used to a culture in which most of us, most of the time, for example, if we're going around the shops or browsing online to see if we want to buy something, you know, we, we tend to look at how much it costs and look at whether we like the product. And that's all we think about for whether we decide whether we want to buy it or not. And actually, we need to be thinking all about what lies behind that product. How was it produced? Who produced it? Because you know, every time you spend or invest money, you are pushing for one future or another. You're supporting some supply chains and, and by, by not investing elsewhere or spending elsewhere, you're, you're hampering other ones. But I think more broadly, there's a kind of a culture of honesty and empathy that we need to cultivate so that it becomes prevalent absolutely everywhere. And that's the way it becomes prevalent in the boardroom 
and in the, in the executive team you know, of every business. And it just becomes unacceptable to be operating in a way that's not from that value set. I think so there's a kind of a more indirect way. And that feeds in through the fact that, you know, everybody who goes to work, most, you know, most people have got friends and loved ones and, you know, they all have expectations of them. And it just becomes, you know, it just becomes more clearly, uh, you know, more clearly unacceptable to everyone at every turn to tell those little white lies and do those little little misrepresentations that have become so, um, so prevalent in, in life today. How can we move away from the selfish mindset where we value our own personal financial interests above the broader interests and welfare of others? Well, I think we need to sell a different vision for things. So, for example, you know, there are lots of people in the UK who can quite happily afford to pay more tax. And, you know, for example, I would be very happy if everybody as rich as me and richer paid a lot more tax. I'd be really happy with it. But why would I be happy with that? It would be because it would be an exchange for a society that I would feel a lot better about. Um, you know, and actually, actually, you know, lots of arguments don't get made properly. There are many, many people who would be better off by paying more tax because they'd be in a world in which everybody's paying more tax and the whole of society and all the infrastructure gets better and the, all the rest of it. And actually living in these sort of bubbles where we all have our own money so that we can all buy our own things to make sure that we're all personally OK is a, is a really rubbish way of going about it. And there, yes, there are a relatively small number of people for whom that really works because the income discrepancies are so high that a few people you know, really do get very rich. But for most people, that, that low taxes kind of way of doing things absolutely doesn't work. And you can pretty well prove mathematically that you know, the trickle down notion the idea that the best way to get the, one way of getting the poor richer is to is to start by getting the rich richer and then a little bit of it trickle down it's pretty well possible to you know you can demonstrate in a pretty firm way that that is it that just does not happen do you think we should instill these values more at a young age perhaps within schools yeah i absolutely i absolutely do and i think you know it's this idea of, you know, what about, what about some people talk about, well, what about white lies? Are they all right? And I think, you know, that takes you onto a very, very slippery slope. So, for example, one of the things we can do with kids is any time they find themselves in front of an advertisement, you know, we can ask the question, what is that advertisement trying to make you believe and to make you want? Because if, you know, if, we can, if we can encourage us, you know, and, and develop that skill in ourselves that we're always asking that question, you know, does this lead us to, does this lead us to want to trust that organization? Does the, is this, or is this organization trying to persuade me, for example, to want to spend money on something that may not be in my best interest? And then, so schools could um, do a lot more of that critical thinking and encouraging students to get behind the head of what's going on and understand the motivations uh, behind it all. And um, the, you know, other simple things like debating societies, right? So we hear all about you know, the Etonian debating society. A lot of our MPs in the UK, you know, come from schools like that. Well, in, in traditional debating that gets taught in some schools, you know, you, 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 you do well by winning a debate even if your argument is completely bogus. In other words, you get points for convincing people to go along with something that's a load of rubbish. Well, in a, you know, in a 21st century fit debating society or debating competition, you would get the most points for doing things like changing your mind in the face of better evidence, right? It's like an anti-skill to be able to win a bogus argument. It's, about, it's critical thinking. Like, mm. I mean, what, what, what leads me to believe that this view is correct and this one is wrong? So that, for example, if they find themselves in Russia on t you know, listening to the evidence about what's going on in Ukraine, we would want, you know, we would want all Russian kids now to have really good skills in discerning fact from fiction. 
and be asking really tough questions. And if that's what we want, then we should absolutely be asking the same of our, uh, of our own kids. But the start point for all of this is to be, is to hone our own skills as best we can. Because we've all got prejudices, you know, we all, I know I've got certain media sources that I prefer to other ones. And you know, it's important for me to be asking really carefully, what is my basis for trusting this source more than this other source? You know, and to go back to who owns them, who funds them, what's their track record on truthfulness? Does it, do their arguments make sense? To me? You know, all those things have to come together. And eventually, you know, out of all that, you have to try to come to a well-founded sense of, yes, this is a trustworthy source, rather than just, this is telling me what I like hearing. We regularly see how much power an elite political, media and corporate minority has. This can often make the average person feel nihilistic in the face of global problems such as climate change. Given the discussion we've had on truth and kindness, what advice would you give to the average person to help them tackle climate change and other global issues? Okay, so it's tempting for all of us to just say, look, these, these, these problems are so big and global and systemic that you know, what can I do as an individual? Uh, and, and, you know, the sort of the uh, one form of denial of our responsibilities is to say, yes, I, I, you know, I understand these bad things are going on, but there's nothing I can do about it. And actually, that's not the case. And we live in such an individualistic society as well that it can be tempting to get sucked into this mindset that says, unless I can totally solve the problem myself individually, there's nothing I can do. You know, there's nothing useful, worthwhile that I can do. And that's not the case. It is a collective problem. And the responsibility for all of us is to try to be a useful part of the solution. And actually, if we're doing our best on that, that's enough. Uh, and so if you ask the question, what can I do to help bring about the conditions under which the big systemic changes that we need um, in the way humans conduct themselves globally, you know, can take place. Um, you know, if you ask that question, that's actually quite an empowering question. So it's, you know, it's about the details of how we live our own lives. We're, none of us are perfect, but it's about trying to move forward on the things, you know, our own consumption patterns. That's a, that's a sort of, you know, step one possibly. But then, just as importantly, alongside of all that, and possibly with more leverage, are these questions about. You know, who do I vote for? Who do I who do I put my trust in? What what media do I absorb? Um, you know, how do I promote these values of truth, uh, truth and kindness everywhere? You know, we all need to get better at tuning into the impacts of the lives of people on the other side of the world that we're never going to meet because here we you know we've globalized now. So like it or not, so um, you know, there's almost everything we do is an opportunity. To, uh, to promote that culture of, uh, of truthfulness and, uh, and empathy that I've, I've been talking about. Now, I hope that's quite an empowering, uh, you know, that's quite an empowering mindset. It'd be great to hear your thoughts about this topic. Let us know what you think in the comments. And as always, look after yourselves, each other, and most importantly, the planet around you. Thanks again, R. Eden.